Let's say this, Spirit of God, teach me what Greg cannot, in Jesus' name, amen. I can't tell you how much the Spirit of God longs to hear you say those words. The Spirit of God is eagerly awaiting people who will pray and say, Spirit of God, teach me. The, 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 the Christ the teacher, the Spirit of God who wants to teach, eagerly is awaiting to teach a generation that is not asking Him. And let that not be us. Amen? I was moved by worship this morning. There was something, this one little line about grace, and it got me thinking about King David. You guys remember him, right? And King David had this awful rotten son. Any of you guys have those? No, don't tell me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> King David had this awful rotten son. Actually, he had some bad kids. And uh, one of them was Absalom, who continually revolted against King David and wanted to kill him. So if you think your kids are bad, you're not at that level yet, right? And uh, King David's son wanted to kill him and constantly made efforts to undermine him and to get rid of him. And King David had opportunities to punish Absalom and he showed him mercy. And many people thought, King David, you show too much mercy. And I thought, Lord, if I could be guilty, let them find me guilty of too much mercy. Let them find me guilty of too much grace. And I know where King David learned it from. He learned it from the God who forgave him. He learned mercy through his father who forgave him. And so that just struck me this morning that God's grace is, is bigger than all of mine combined. And that if I could be guilty of anything, that it would be of having too much grace and too much mercy. Amen? Let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 5 if you have your workbooks handy. You know, I brought a... Um, uh, a chalkboard out today since we're back to school time. I thought maybe this would be helpful uh, since we're back to school. Maybe I could write some stuff up here to kind of help illustrate the things that we've been talking about. I got to be honest with you, I, I don't feel a single ounce of responsibility to change your life. That's your problem. And the reason I don't feel a single ounce of responsibility in changing your life is because I can't do it. The only person that I can change is me. And as I change, I want to I wanna show you and, and give you things that helped me. And so I'm here to, to give uh, illustrations and show things that I'm learning and things that are helping me change my life. I'm, I can't change your life and I don't have any hope in changing your life. I know I can't do that. But the one thing I will try to do is to inspire you to try to change your own. And uh, this was a hard lesson. It's taken me a while to figure that out because, you know, sometimes when, you, when you're, you're teaching and preaching messages, you want people to get it and you want people to learn and you want people to get better. And when they don't, you take that personally. And I've realized I can't actually take it personally because there's nothing I can do for you. I can't change your life at all. And so I understand that my role is to hopefully inspire you or motivate you or show you in some ways how you can change your own life. Amen? This message that I am attempting to convey over the past month or so is been life-changing to me, and I, it has been one of the most eye-opening experiences I have ever experienced in my Christianity. And I can't 
I, I feel like I cannot say enough or describe enough to try to make it so plain what God wants for us. And it goes back to the garden and Adam and Eve and the choice they made for the knowledge of good and evil. And man, that old knowledge of good and evil was a bad choice then, wasn't it? Wasn't it? Do you believe that? But is it still the wrong choice today? Every bit. It's still every bit of the wrong choice today as it was back then. And it's so easy to look back and go, what a bad choice that was back then. And to not recognize what a bad choice it is today. That knowledge of good and evil. And so I want to try to help describe to you what has happened with the knowledge of good and evil and exactly what has happened when, when we partook of that knowledge of good and evil and how we have been born and raised in the knowledge of good and evil and how bad it is for us and what it has done to us and how it has caused us to see the world. And essentially what has happened is the moment that the knowledge of good and evil was chosen, the world did not change. We did. And the things that were happening around us did not change. The way we perceived it changed. And it's like we put on a new set of lenses. Right? We put on this new way of seeing things that we were not designed and intended to see. It's like, uh, it's like we put on these virtual reality goggles. You guys seen those? I would have brought some of those in, but I don't have any. But I know a couple of you might, but there are these you know, goggles, and they, they allow you to see things that look real, but aren't which is what the knowledge of good and evil is. It allows you to see these things that look real, but aren't. And it was the promise that you were going to see something more, that you were going to be able to see in another dimension. And you did. It was a dimension you didn't want to see. It was a dimension that you were not meant to see. And that is the knowledge of good and evil. And therefore, since that time, we have seen the world through the knowledge of good and evil. And what that means is, is that everything that you process and everything that comes into your life, everything that you experience, you will divide into two categories. Good and evil. So all the information that is coming into you, everything that's coming into your life, you are now putting it into two different, two different channels. There is good and there is evil. Uh, let's see, what are some other things that we might describe as good and evil? Oh, yeah, this is the one I'm looking for. Here it is. This is the one I'm looking for. We got wrong and we got right. How do you spell right? Is it with a W or an R? It's just an R? Yeah. We did not come here for spelling lessons. Everything that you process is going to be put into good and right or evil and bad and wrong. Everything that you experience, you're going to put it into those categories. And the problem with that is that most of the things that you experience will be put in here. All the things that have happened to you all of the stuff that people have said. There's so much of this going on in the world, and there's so much that's happening that's going into the evil and bad and wrong. We see a lot of wrong in the world, don't we? Come on. You know it. You're looking around. The, the news is full of what is wrong. In fact, they highlight when one thing happens right. And so as a result of that... 
most of the things that are coming into your life are going into this category. And then there are very few, every now and then, stuff that comes into here. And this is the law. This is the Ten Commandments. This is the hundred commandments that came with it. This is the law. This is all the stuff that says, here's what's right and wrong. Here's what's good and evil. And we filter in our lives all of this stuff and everything that happens in our life, we put it into those categories. And the problem is, is that we don't feel good because this category is overwhelmingly full and this category is overwhelmingly empty. And because of that, we feel a need to settle the score. We feel a need that we must balance these because the world is not right if these things aren't balanced. And so we need these things to be right. We need this to be balanced. And here's what I'm here to tell you. It never will. As long as we are living on this planet, this is the outcome when we are measuring good and evil. The world's a wicked place. And if you're waiting for more good things to happen than bad things, you're going to be waiting for the rest of your life. And so because this balance isn't here, we try to make that balance happen. And this is frustrating. This is so frustrating. And what it does is it causes us to be mad, to be angry, and to become bitter. In fact, let me put it to you like this. How many of you guys, how many of you guys have ever had an, an enemy? Okay, almost all of you. Yeah. Yeah. Some of you might say, no, not me. I love everyone and everyone's my friend. Okay, we'll get to you in a minute. <laughs> As we have enemies, do you know why we have enemies? Because we process everything through right and wrong. That's why we have enemies. And there came this man called Jesus. And in Matthew chapter 5, he came to the people and he said, I'm about to blow your mind. You guys aren't ready for this. But I'm going to redefine life. See, this right here is the law. And it's not... It's not balanced for us. And I want you to take a look at what, what is said here in Matthew chapter 5 that Jesus said. And maybe there's some light to this that you can see now. In Matthew chapter 5 verse 17 in your workbooks, it says, Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. I did not come to destroy it, but to fulfill it. Jesus came to fulfill this. He didn't come to destroy this. He came to fulfill this. In other words, another word for fulfill is to complete it. Jesus came to complete this. And yet, we spend most of our lives trying to complete this. Doing something that Jesus has already done. He came and he did not come to destroy this, but to complete it to fulfill it, to make sure that there was a balance in everything and he filled all of the law and fulfilled every single ounce of it. And so all of our efforts to make this right is futile and it's nonsense. And so Jesus, he comes and this is his first sermon that he's preaching and he announces to them that he did not come to destroy it, but he has fulfilled this and he is essentially saying, this is no longer how we are going to operate under the knowledge of good and evil, but we are now going to begin to operate under new principles, kingdom principles. That we have a different way of thinking and a different way of doing things now and it is not about good and evil, but it is about kingdom principles. 
I did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it, to complete it. You have heard that it was said. This is in uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 38. You have heard it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you not to resist an evil person, but whoever slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him and give him the other also. How many of you guys know that in the same sermon, Jesus also said this, love your enemies. You guys have enemies? How many of you love them? How about this one? The Bible, Jesus in the same sermon says this, pray for those who persecute you. Listen, I want to get super real this morning. He says, pray for those who persecute you. I'm guessing that if we got real honest with ourselves, Those of you who are Democrats aren't praying for Donald Trump. And I'm guessing of you hardcore Republicans aren't praying for Nancy Pelosi and MSNBC. I bet you're not praying for them. <laughs> one time, yeah, one time, yeah. I did one time. Did that count? And I, I bet that if you've been punched in the face, that you didn't turn around and go, you forgot one. And that people who stole from you, you didn't call them back and say, hey, bro, you missed something. <laughs> There's some more stuff in here, man. You missed the best room. In fact, we want to punish all of those people. Still. Because this notion that Jesus is suggesting in our current mind sense is absolute nonsense. We hear it and we know, yes, Jesus said it and it's the right thing to do. But to us, it, the idea of actually being able to execute and carry out these instructions of Jesus, that we are to love our enemies, that we are to pray for those who persecute us and spitefully use us, and that when someone strikes us or attacks us, that instead of returning that, that we just turn the other cheek, that we pray for them. The actual carrying out of that cannot happen in our lives if our mindset is the knowledge of good and evil. There's a reason why it doesn't work. There's a reason why Jesus said, this is what I want you to do. And we all go, yeah, Jesus, we will gladly do that. And then never do it. There's a reason why when someone says something rude to me, I feel this overwhelming need to say something rude to them. Anybody else? Jesus said, I want you to love your enemies. You guys all raised your hands and said, I've got enemies. Most of you. And deep down, do you love those enemies? How about this one then? And have you ever been in an argument? Come on, I want to see some hands. Who's been in an argument? It, within the last month or two, you've been in an argument. Yeah. Yeah. Anyone who's not raising your hands is single. And that's okay. I get it. You know? <laughs> it does, doesn't it? It does. But we are always getting into arguments and we have enemies. And the reason that we get into arguments... Is because people say things that aren't right. Because the stuff you're saying isn't right and I need to fix it. Because the stuff you're saying is going in here and I need a balance. So I'm going to say stuff that's going to help balance this out. And the problem with that is... is that if you're going to say something in an argument to balance it out, you are making one false assumption. 
You see, when the other person is wrong, what does that make you? And what I'm telling you is that when one person is wrong, that makes you also wrong. Because the only thing that makes you right is the blood of Jesus. It's not your facts or your political beliefs. Do you realize that all of you who are Republicans believe that you are right? And you are absolutely wrong. And all of you Democrats believe that you are noble and high values and that you are absolutely right. And the problem with that is, is that you are absolutely wrong. And what we can't reconcile in our head because we operate under these other false pretenses, we, we, we look through the world through these, these lenses of good and evil. Therefore, we cannot see that it's actually evil and evil. And we assume that they're evil and I'm good. And that in all of our arguments and conflicts, we make the false assumption that they're evil and I'm good. And maybe you're saying, no, no, I know I'm not right. I know I made some mistakes too. Anybody ever said that? I know I've made some mistakes too. But as I say that, what does it sound like? Huh? Okay. Yeah. I realize I'm... In, believe me, listen. <laughs> I have said on numerous occasions, I know I'm not perfect. I've made mistakes too. What's the next word that proceeds out of our mouth when we say that? Oh my goodness, you all saw that one coming from a mile away, right? That is a big old butt. <laughs> But, I'm more right than they are. I'm less wrong than they are. I'm more right than they are, which makes me right in my eyes. And so this will never, ever work. As long as this has to be balanced by us, this will never work in our lives. This is why we will always fight, and we will never be fulfilled, and we will fight and fight and not win, and never feel fulfilled. Instead, Jesus says, I want to offer you something different than the knowledge of good and evil. I want to give you a kingdom perspective. I want to take this lens off that has been filtering and that is this cloudy vision that doesn't allow you to see reality and truth. I want to take those off and give you a new perspective. I want to give you a kingdom perspective that will allow you the ability to be in an argument and to not have to fight back. I want to give you the ability to be able to pray for your enemies. I want to give you the ability to be able to, to pray for those who, who persecute you and spitefully use you. To love those who hate you. To be able to take, and when people take from you, you, you be able to go, you missed something, here's my coat as well. I want to give you that ability is what Jesus is saying. And he gives us that ability by, first of all, fulfilling all the law. And because he fulfilled the law, he can now take that lens off of us for us and offer us a kingdom perspective to see the world differently. Let's say... Um, Let's say people let's say people start making lies up about me. Right? Let's say that they start saying things and they start making up a bunch of stories about bad things that I'm doing and they're making up all these stories, right? Under this system, I would have to put that in this category, wouldn't I? But the moment that I do that, I say all that stuff you're saying about me is wrong and it's evil and it's wicked and it's bad. And you shouldn't be saying that stuff about me. 
Once I make that declaration about the things that those people are saying, where do I put myself? I'm okay. You can't say bad stuff about me. I'm awesome. I'm good. And doggone it, people like me. I got a church. I preach. I go to church all the time. We do Bible studies and discipleship and all this stuff. And they're saying, and I'm given all this evidence about how good I am. Trying to fulfill the law that Jesus has already fulfilled. And Jesus is saying, dude, I don't need you to give me a resume of how good you are. You need to give them a resume of how good God is. This is not about how good or bad you are, man. This is about how good God is. What did Jesus do? It's not about what you did. Yeah, but they're saying things that are wrong about me. Yeah, and there's a lot of things that are wrong about you that people don't say. We didn't consider that one, did we? And so what Jesus is saying is, I'll fulfill this and I'll be your defense. And I don't need you to defend yourself, but what I want you to understand, Greg, is that as all of these things are happening, they are just happening. And the way that you've been perceiving it is that they're happening to you. Well, yeah, they're saying the bad stuff about me. Yeah, but that doesn't mean that it's happening to you. Because when things happen to you, you are already putting them in this category of good and evil. And, and you know, a, a word we use a lot over here is unfair. Anybody ever experienced stuff that's unfair? What do we need to do when things are unfair? Well, by God, we need to make it fair. It's not fair. You know, it's hilarious because we're all laughing, right? Because that's, you know, that's kind of silly. Because our kids always say, it's not fair. And what do we tell them? Life's not fair. <laughs> Except as adults, we want things to be fair. How many times are we complaining about things not being fair? You know what they're doing to Christians now? It's not fair. Okay. So what? Jesus said we're going to be persecuted. Well, that's not fair. It doesn't have to be. We don't need this to balance out. Actually, Jesus already told us that he is the balance to it. Things aren't happening. You, you can look at it and say, all this stuff is happening to me. Or you can say, all this stuff is happening. You have that option. Right? I can look at people making up all these rumors and I can say, okay, Jesus is giving me this option that says, uh, this is happening. This is an event that's happening. That's all it is. It's an event that's happening in your life. The knowledge of good and evil says this is a negative event that is happening to you. But a kingdom perspective is this is an event that is happening and what do you want to do now that this event has taken place? What do you want to do? Because I'm going to give you two options here. And one of them is, is you can produce fruit or you can destroy and consume. Those are your options. it's not that it's happening to me, it's just that it's happening. And now that it's happening, I have options in front of me. I can either choose to produce or choose to destroy and consume. What do I want? And you got to ask yourself, what do you want? You see, when we operate under the knowledge of good and evil, we don't have these options. Because this has to balance out. This is why we're frustrated in our Christianity. This is why we're failing in our Christianity. This is why it's so hard to look at the words of Jesus and go, yeah, those are great. I can't do it. 
but I'm sure going to pretend like I am. Well, I can't do all of the stuff that Jesus actually described there, so I'll just do some other stuff. I mean, seriously, you think about what Jesus asked us to do. When someone slaps you on your right cheek, turn the other to him also. Wow. If anyone wants to sue you and take away your tunic, let him have it and your cloak also. Do you know why we can't do that? Because it's not right. It's not fair. Whoever compels you to go one mile, go with them too. Give to him who asks you, and from him who wants to borrow from you, do not turn away. Well, I can't because it's, it's not right. And the stuff they're doing is not right, and it's not fair. You've heard that it was said that you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies and bless those who curse you and do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends the rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward have you? Do not even the tax, tax collectors do the same? One of the hardest pieces to this equation is the self-deception that we live in. That we believe we're good. And that we see the world in good and evil, and we typically, by and large, believe ourselves to be good. I cannot tell you how many people in my life, and how many times as a young man, I said the same thing, that basically, I'm a pretty good guy. And that is a huge misconception. And as long as I believe that I'm a pretty good guy, the world won't make sense to me. And I can't wrap my mind around this good and evil thing and it'll always be unfair. Because when you perceive yourself to be a good person, life will be really unfair for you. And we'll start to talk about things like what we deserve. And I deserve better than this and I deserve more than this and I deserve to be treated like this and this because I'm, after all, a good person. And so it can be very hard to be happy in this world that is full of wickedness and evil and to believe that we're good people. And it's really like, it's really easy to be self-deceived to believing that we're good people because it's most of the stuff that we hear, right? We hear it all the time that we're good people and as long as you pay your taxes and do this and that, you're a good person. Or as long as you go to church, you're a good person. And really all we're doing is comparing ourselves to more wicked people. All right? There's great country songs saying, I believe most people are good. Well, you know what? That sounds good, but it's not even close to accurate. Because most people ain't good. And I'll give you an example. Read Matthew 5 through 7 and then tell me if you're good. Look at the expectations that Jesus set and then tell me that you're good. Read through all the things that Jesus said when your enemy smacks you in the face, give him the other. And you're going to tell me then that we're still good? When we go through that list of stuff, are we still good? Here's the catch is that Jesus fulfilled the law. And he accomplished the law, and he completed the law. Therefore, the law is done, and he makes me good. It's not based on my behavior or my works. It's based on his behavior and his works. And so here's the option that I can now see because of Christ. I don't need to fulfill this. This is fulfilled in my life. Therefore, when I get to this position, I'm not worried about what's happening to me. I've already know what happened to Jesus. This isn't an event that happened to me. This is an event that happened to Jesus. People said stuff about me, made up rumors and lies, and said a bunch of wicked things. Uh, that actually happened to Jesus. The stuff that we believe has happened to us are really the things that have happened to Jesus, and he fulfilled that balance. Well, somebody needs to pay. Somebody did pay. 
Somebody did pay. This is an issue that's already been solved. And if I spend my life trying to chase down making people pay and making things fair and making the world balanced out, I will spend the rest of my de life defeated and discouraged and depressed because it'll never be fulfilled. And there'll never be a balance to these scales because it's already been balanced in Jesus Christ. So I can see the world differently now. That things don't have to happen to me, they already happened to him. And therefore, the translation that he's translating is, is this is an event, what do you want to do with it? This is, a, this is an event that has taken place now. What do you want to do? What do you want to produce? It doesn't matter what the event is. What do you want to happen right now? Because when we have this option, this is powerful. This is how Paul and, and, and Silas could be sitting in jail stocks, sitting in the middle of prison, and they could be saying, this isn't fair. We're just out here telling people about Jesus. We're just a couple of good old boys telling folks about the Lord. And they came and arrested us. This ain't fair. If, if they needed it to be fair, they would have died in that prison. Come on. If they needed things to be fair, they would have ended up dying in that prison because it would not have happened. Because Jesus never promised them, when you go through this life, everything's going to be fair. In fact, he's telling us a much different story. You're going to get smacked in the face. <laughs> People are going to say stuff about you. People are going to persecute you. You're going to have enemies. And I want you to know that all of that stuff is going to happen and that life isn't fair. But you don't need to make it fair. I'll make it fair. And you put your trust in me and you produce. So what I want you to know is that when things are happening in your life, they're not happening to you. They're just happening. And you get to make a choice how you want to produce. Do you want to produce fruit? Do you want to produce patience, love, joy, kindness, long-suffering? Do you want to produce those things? Or do you want to destroy and consume? Because you got the option. Or you could put the blinders back on. Don't take the red pill. Take the blue pill. Go back to sleep and try to fulfill the law. And it won't work. But you still have those options. And I just want you to go through this life being free. Because this right here is an enormous amount of bondage that you can't get out of. This right here is freeing. It's incredibly freeing. What a freeing way to go through life knowing I don't have to balance the score. I don't have to defend what you say about me. I don't have to be right. And it, I, I can tell you this. It's going to take a lot of practice. Because you have had however young you are, you've had that many years of the knowledge of good and evil. Think about it. Every story you've ever heard has a good guy and a bad guy. Every movie you watch has a good guy and a bad guy. Every TV show you watch has a good guy and a bad guy. Every book you read, every story, every novel. When you go to work, there's there's the good guys and the bad guys. There's the greasers and the socias. There's whatever it is. There's always things being broken down into these categories. And this is where we have lived most of our lives. And it will take us some time to retrain our brain. But this is what Jesus is offering. When he says, I want to give you something new. You've, you're used to this. You've heard it this way. But no longer is it that way. I'm giving you something new. The law is officially fulfilled. Amen? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word.